1660, Denmark was kind of a mess. To be fair, so were Norway and Sweden. All three had, in 1397, agreed to unite in a personal union under the rulership of Queen Margaret I of Denmark, to be treated as equal partners. Queen Margaret had other ideas, though, and seemed to favor Denmark, so for the next 125 years, Sweden had trouble really committing to the relationship. Every few years they'd break away, and one of the other two would have to go have a word with them. The sort of word that sounded a lot like an army coming to fix your attitude and then bring you back into the fold. Eventually, in the 1520s, disputes over Stockholm and who got to run the place came to a head, and the Union was officially dissolved in 1523. All three countries went their separate ways. When the Protestant Reformation finally got to Scandinavia, and Denmark officially converted to Lutheranism in 1536, they decided to get back with Norway, becoming what is referred to as the Twin Kingdoms. Almost immediately, the two countries began eyeballing Sweden again. Denmark tried numerous times to reassert control. King Christian IV attacked Sweden in 1611 and failed to bring them back into the Union, gained no land, and yet somehow still managed to make Sweden pay one million silver riksdaler to Denmark for the privilege of being almost but not really conquered. With that money, King Christian, among other things, started his own trading company modeled on the Dutch East India Trading Company. Unfortunately, the one thing they traded in most was slaves. From there, things just got worse for Denmark. The Thirty Years' War went poorly for the Danish, so badly that the Catholics were able to force Denmark out of the war by taking Jutland. Meanwhile, King Gustav Adolphus of Sweden successfully intervened in Germany. This convinced everyone that Sweden was the real power in Scandinavia and Denmark was just a limp dishrag. At which news, the Swedes attempted to invade Jutland themselves and take it in 1643, just to see if they could. Turns out, they could. A treaty saw Denmark-Norway give up land in Denmark, Norway, and the last bit of Estonia under Danish control to Sweden in 1645. In 1657, King Frederick III of Denmark had enough, declared war on Sweden, and then lost horribly, giving up even more land in the ensuing peace treaty. Which was a lucky escape, really, because the next year King Gustav decided he was unhappy he hadn't thoroughly destroyed Denmark and laid siege to Copenhagen for the next two years before finally giving up and going home, unable to take the city. And we guess you have to call that one in favor of Denmark because they remained independent and got some of their land back, but it sure didn't look like a victory when all was said and done. Which brings us back to where we were at the beginning, 1660. Denmark is in kind of a bad spot. Some of its former land is still under Swedish control, and Copenhagen is still recovering from the two-year siege. And because Norway is still being ruled from Denmark, it's also in a bad spot. However, the resistance Frederick III puts up against the Swedes makes him pretty popular. So he decides that he needs more power in order to fix all the things that are wrong, and leverages his popularity to get it. To do this, he changes the monarchy of Denmark-Norway from an elected one to an absolute one, and most folks just kind of go along with it. Not everyone is entirely happy about it though, but since Frederick does indeed have a lot more power and authority, there's not much they can do. And boy did he use it, the Twin Kingdoms become one of the most stringent absolute monarchies in Europe. As part of the changeover, Frederick III orders a throne chair to be created. Danish carpenter and painter Bendix Grotschling begins the work in 1662. He takes, as his humble inspiration, the throne of King Solomon as described in the Bible in 1 Kings chapter 10 verses 18 to 20. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with refined gold. There were six steps to the throne and a round top to the throne at its rear, and arms on each side of the seat, and two lions standing beside the arms. Twelve lions were standing there on the six steps on the one side and on the other. Nothing like it was made for any other kingdom. Well, nothing like it until King Frederick came along. 
When it was finally finished nine years later, along with all its lions adorned in silver and gold, it became the symbol of the absolute monarchy of the Twin Kingdoms for the next century and a half. Of course, Bendix knew when he made the throne that it was going to be important. After all, how often do you get to make a brand new throne for all of Denmark? So the materials used had to be special. Gold and silver were obvious choices, but where do you get the ivory? And from what? In the end, only one source would do, really. And when the throne was presented, and folks asked what it was made of, King Frederick had but one answer. Unicorns. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. The throne chair of Denmark is not the only symbol of royalty to be made of unicorn horn. In the 1400s, France's Duke of Burgundy, Charles the Bold, marched off to a series of disastrous battles that ultimately cost him his life. The hilt of his sword and the scabbard it went in were said to be made of alicorn, the official term for a unicorn's horn. And during the early 1600s, Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II commissioned the imperial crown of Austria as his own personal crown for wearing out and about since the official crown of the empire wasn't allowed to leave Nuremberg. When his successor and brother, Emperor Matthias, had a scepter and imperial orb made to go with the crown, the scepter was said to have been made from unicorn horn. But using alicorns to make the throne chair of Denmark would have been particularly remarkable, especially in Denmark and especially at that time. In 1646, English polymath and author Thomas Brown had just published the first of what would eventually be six editions of his popular Pseudodoxia Epidemica, or inquiries into very many received tenets and commonly presumed truths, in which he disproved the existence of unicorns, among other things, by a variety of scientific method and analysis of the historical record generally regarded as one of the chief factors in paving the way for subsequent popular scientific journalism, it was comprised of seven volumes and translated into four languages, including Dutch, throughout the 17th century. But even more significantly, in Denmark in 1638, just 25 years before work on the throne was begun, physician, natural historian, antiquarian, and University of Copenhagen professor Ole Wurm had already been hard at work. Over the course of his life and career, Worm, who taught Greek, Latin, physics, and medicine, made significant contributions to the field of embryology, had cranial bones named after him, wrote treatises and books on runestones and early Scandinavian literature, proved lemmings were rodents and did not spontaneously generate out of the air, see our episode on lemmings for more, and had been personally introduced to the bishops of Norway and Denmark by the king of Denmark himself. To be fair, that might have been Frederick's predecessor, King Christian IV, but Ole was still alive, well into Frederick's reign, and had already shown that unicorns didn't exist. He'd even gone so far as to prove that all instances of alicorns were, in fact, narwhal tusks. So come on, a throne made of unicorns? The narwhal is a toothed whale that lives in the waters off Greenland, Canada, and Russia. They share a classification family with the beluga whale and, except for one particularly significant feature, look very much like them. So closely related are they that it is possible for the two species to interbreed, as evidenced by the skull of an unknown whale type collected by scientists sometime in the 1990s that later DNA testing confirmed to contain DNA from both types. Adult narwhals weigh in the neighborhood of 1,700 to 3,500 pounds depending on gender, and males of the species range from 13 to 18 feet long. They primarily feed on cod, halibut, and flatfish, and, like most tooth whales, communicate by clicks and whistles. Strangely for a whale, one of the most common causes of death for a narwhal is suffocation. They can become trapped under sea ice in the winters and fail to find or make a hole sufficiently large enough for them to surface for air. In one recorded instance in 1915, over a thousand narwhals essentially drowned in the waters off West Greenland when they were unable to get to open water. 
The one particular feature of the narwhal that separates it from the beluga whale is, of course, the long horn which most males and some females sport. And let's be clear, it isn't actually a horn, it's a tusk. The left canine tooth in males projects from the upper jaw and through the lip as it grows throughout the narwhal's life, while at the same time twisting into a characteristic left-handed, helical, like a staircase, spiral. And no one really knows what the narwhal uses that tusk for. Some see it as a weapon for fighting off rivals or predators, though this doesn't seem to bother the orcas who regularly prey upon them. Others suggest that it exists to open holes in sea ice, though see above. Still others suggest that it is used in feeding or as an acoustic organ. Mostly, though, it just seems to be a secondary sex characteristic sometimes used to resolve arguments non-violently among males via the usual minds-bigger-than-yours method. Although, curiously, the tusk contains millions of sensory nerve endings that seem to connect information about the seawater surrounding the tusk with sections of the narwhal brain. It's even been suggested that rather than being displays of aggression and rivalry, when two narwhals rub their tusks together, there is a transfer of information about the waters each of them traveled through. Though this does sort of fall apart when the case of the tuskless female is considered, and it is noted that they seem to function perfectly well without the tusks. Occasionally, though, females do produce a tusk similar to the males. The tusks themselves are anywhere from 5 to 10 feet long, hollow, and weigh about 22 pounds. They always protrude from the left, although occasionally, in about 1 in 500 males, both the left and right upper canine will grow, producing a very rare double-tusked narwhal. Only about 15% of females will grow a tusk themselves, usually of smaller size and with less of a spiral than the males. And, in the rarest of the rare, a zoological museum in Hamburg contains a female narwhal skull collected in 1684, containing two tusks. You can thank the Vikings for perpetuating the myth of the narwhal tusk as unicorn horn. They spotted early on that the rest of Europe basically had an obsession with unicorn horns and their legendary properties during the medieval period, and were very happy to sell tusks for lots of extra money when everyone else thought they were alicorns. Which, fair enough, truth in advertising was hard to come by back then. And frankly, the stories about unicorn horns, which we'll come back to, were fairly fantastic. You can kind of see how, if you didn't know any better and thought unicorns were real creatures that you just hadn't had a chance to see yet, you can see how having one's horn might be the best thing you ever got. And it was easy to explain why you hadn't seen one. They were so incredibly hard to find, according to the stories let alone catch, that few people had ever done so. And as we all know, rarity plus desire can put a price through the roof. Now, just in case we haven't been entirely clear here, the reason for the rarity of unicorn horn was that unicorns don't actually exist. Not even in a they used to but don't anymore sort of way, in spite of any amusing stories about Noah's Ark you might have heard. And narwhals notoriously don't actually look like classic unicorns. Not unless whomever is doing the looking is particularly myopic. But frankly, it's not too clear what unicorns do look like, so how would you know if you'd seen one or not? Presumably the single horn would be a dead giveaway, whatever else was going on. But even that might not be the case. The Indus Valley Civilization, so named because it was situated in the Indus River Valley of what is now Pakistan, is so old that its true beginnings predate recorded history. Certainly they were in existence from at least the 33rd to 14th centuries BCE, though its most mature form is taken to be from 2600 to 1900 BCE. Ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia were around at about the same time, but the Indus Valley Civilization was the most widespread. It stretched from the present-day Pakistan-Iran border in the west to near New Delhi in the east, and from Islamabad in the north to Rajkot in India on the Arabian Sea in the south. Their cities, of which there were many, had water supply and drainage systems, brick houses, urban planning, and large non-residential buildings. They developed a system of consistent weights and measures and, at its height, 
It is estimated that between 1 and 5 million people were part of the IVC. One of the things such a large civilization made use of was official seals for persons of status and rank. Several seals in the Indus Valley civilization have been found, among them seals containing the image of what can only be described as a unicorn. Clearly a four-legged beast with a tail on one end and a long single horn protruding from its forehead. There can be no other explanation for it. You look at it and you think unicorn. Except maybe you only think unicorn if you already have some notion of what a unicorn is. Because the other thing it might be is a depiction of an ancient cattle precursor called an auroch, depicted in very strict profile. The clue to this might be that the legs of the creature depicted are all four the same length, even the ones that should be visually behind the creature. So perhaps what we are really seeing is a very large cow facing left with one horn hidden behind the other. The other thing in favor of this interpretation, Oryx actually existed all through the region. Anyway, it's hard to know for certain what is being shown, or even what it all means exactly, but the seals in question are taken to be some of the earliest representations of unicorns in art. Truthfully, there are seals that were found depicting bulls with two horns, but equally as truthfully, other seals were found depicting what are clearly elephants with only one tusk. We may never know for sure what was being shown or why, because as yet, no one has managed to decipher the language and writings of the IVC people. We don't even know what they called themselves. We can be fairly certain it wasn't the Indus Valley civilization, though. And then the Greeks come on the scene. But the Greeks didn't treat unicorns as mythological beasts. Instead, they turn up as part of Greek natural histories. In other words, Greeks thought of them as real, albeit distant creatures. One of the first to write about them as a real creature was the historian and personal physician to Artaxerxes II, Cetesius, from the 5th century BCE. His 23-volume history of the Persian Empire and a volume about India purported to relate both the political and natural history of both regions. The Indian volume described the unicorn, according to Cetesius, as a wild ass, flea of foot, having a horn 28 inches in length and colored white, red, and black. Oh, and you could make a fancy cup from unicorn horn that would protect you from disease and poison if you drink from it. Which is nice. The entire thing is suspect, though. You see, Cetesius hadn't been to India and certainly hadn't seen any unicorns himself. Instead, he got his information from visiting Persia. The old Persian capital of Persepolis contains, on its walls, relief sculptures depicting unicorns. In fact, my own father visited Persepolis during his time in the service and brought back photographs showing some of the purported unicorns being attacked by and fighting lions. They're wonderfully done reliefs, but to call the animal depicted a unicorn is to rely entirely on the same problem of perspective as the Bronze Age IVC seals. They might be bulls, they might, as my father suggested, be deer or antelope, but upon looking at them, your first thought is not any sort of unicorn at all. Cetesius' version isn't the only one, though, just the first. Aristotle suggested that the oryx was a unicorn, as well as the so-called Indian ass. Mythological animal's greatest friend ever, Pliny the Elder, suggested the Indian ox, which isn't really a thing, but he may have meant the rhinoceros. And just to put a cap on it, in the 6th century, an Alexandrian merchant named Cosmas went to the palace of the king of Ethiopia and saw four brass figures there, which he called unicorns and said, it is impossible to take this ferocious beast alive and that all its strength lies in its horn. When it finds itself pursued and in danger of capture, it throws itself from a precipice and turns so aptly in falling that it receives all the shock upon the horn and so escapes safe and sound, which is ridiculous. Ridiculous. Later medieval and renaissance sources were no better help. Much of their information came from ancient Greek and Rome anyway, so it was mostly just a repetition of earlier speculation and myth. This saw the unicorn represented as some variety of goat, wild ass, or horse. By then, the origin of the unicorn was so separated by time that no one really knew what it meant anymore. 
but there certainly was a lot of art and talk about them. So suddenly there's all this symbolism laying around unused and, much as we discussed in our episode on statues, someone decided that things mean things. And one of the things that should mean things ought to be this strange unicorn everyone knew about, but didn't understand. I mean, that's a pretty rough guess, and I wouldn't go to history class with it, but it works well enough. Because what happens next is that in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, all of a sudden, the unicorn takes on a whole new significance. And if you remember that much of what survived in terms of knowledge about the world during the Dark Ages survived because it was primarily locked up in some of the few places to contain people who knew how to read and write, and that those places were called monasteries and existed because pious and devoted Christians gathered together, you can practically write the next paragraph in the history of the unicorn yourself without even trying. See, in the Bible, there is reference to a creature called a reem. The problem is, no one is exactly sure what a reem was. Guesses ran the gamut, a very similar gamut to guesses about the unicorn. So much so that in many translations of the Bible and accompanying texts, reem was just translated straight to unicorn. And since it is in the Bible, and the Bible is regarded as highly symbolic in nature and also true, it stood to reason that the unicorn was also highly symbolic and true. But symbolic of what? Well, in the early Middle Ages, a period referred to as Late Antiquity, a sort of medieval bestiary came out called the Physiologus that helped explain just what the unicorn meant, biblically speaking. You see, the unicorn is entranced by a fair maiden, who was obviously the Virgin Mary, and the unicorn is such a rare and special beastie that it clearly stands in for the incarnation of Christ. So you see, Christ came to the Virgin Mary because of her purity, and thus was born into the world. When you see a unicorn in medieval and renaissance art, you're looking at Christ incarnate in the flesh. Unless, of course, it really represents, in being captured and killed, the passion of the Christ. And really, from there, it's a short step to chivalrous love, and then courtly love, and then romantic love in general, and because of its associations with the Virgin Mary, chastity, and faith. That's enough to get it used in heraldry in the 15th century, where it eventually becomes the symbol of Scotland. Not particularly because Scotland is well known as a home to unicorns, but because, if you recall our discussion of the reliefs of Persepolis, the unicorn appears to be the natural enemy of the lion, which is the symbol of England. Meanwhile, Physiologus gives us the rest of the things we seem to know about unicorn mythology. How to catch one? Needs a virgin. Need to purify a body of water? Just wait until a unicorn shows up, makes the sign of the cross with its horn, and dips its head in to drink. When the horn touches the water, you're good to go. In fact, so well known did the protective properties of alicorns become that it soon expanded to protection from leprosy, rubella, measles, fevers, and even the plague and venoms from snakes and scorpions. And because an alicorn is a long, straight thing, you'll never guess what else it was rumored to do. And so you can see just how valuable unicorn horn became and how expensive even a sniff of one was. Bits and pieces of ivory and dust from workshop floors all over Europe instantly became worth incredible amounts of money if the word unicorn was merely whispered in their presence. And now you know why the throne chair of Denmark was legendarily said to be made of unicorn horn. Alicorn was protective and purifying. It represented both authority and power. It was tied deeply into Christian symbolism by virtue of being associated with the earthly body of Christ. Unicorns even had roots which ran back through the greatest empires in history, which were all things a king who had just implemented absolute monarchy in a troubled country needed in order to assert his divine right to rule. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. GM Word of the Week is supported by the kind contributions of our patrons on Patreon. If you enjoyed this episode, head over to our website at gmwordoftheweek.com 
where you can find out how to support the show yourself, subscribe to it on all your favorite podcatchers, and find even more episodes to enjoy. This episode was written, researched, and produced by me, Brian Casey. Today's music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions and Epidemic Sound. And remember, never play leapfrog with a unicorn. <laughs>